Just a reminder that this class is for the general public. If you have any questions that are specific to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, please let the missionaries know and they will try to answer those questions. We're grateful for Sister Ward. She is in the library and available either in person or online Tuesdays and Thursdays from 4 to 8 p.m. Mountain Time. So, Sister Ward, I will stop sharing and turn the time over to you. All right. Let me get my screen shared here. Can everybody see it? Yes, we can. Wonderful. So today's presentation is the first in what's going to be a four-part series on Scottish research. Today's is where did your Scottish ancestors live and work? Um, understanding UK geography and census records. So by way of introduction, my name is Erica Ward. I'm uh, happy to be with you today. I've been a genealogist all my life and seriously, like all my life. In fact, when I was in kindergarten, the teacher called home very concerned after we were asked to draw a picture of what we did over the summer break and I created this. <clears throat> yes, we had taken a family trip to look at headstones and so I drew this lovely picture of myself and my parents happily spending time in a cemetery. My teacher was worried that there had been a death in the family. But thanks to my mom's enthusiasm, we were quite involved as children and I can remember my siblings and I all lined up in a row at a bunch of microfilm machines, each with a list of surnames and sitting there scrolling through, <laughs> looking at the pages. So I think my brothers would have preferred to be outside playing, but I thought it was fantastic. I felt very grown up sitting at those machines. Um, my Scottish knowledge background is primarily from my studies at the University of Strathclyde, based in Glasgow, Scotland. I hold a postgraduate certificate in genealogical, paleographic, and heraldic studies. When I tell people this, I get a lot of questions about the course. So since you're wanting to learn about Scottish research, I thought it would be good to explain just a little bit about the course in case in anyone is interested in pursuing something like this. So it's a three-part course and it's administered online so you can study from anywhere in the world. Uh, the first part is a postgraduate certificate, which consists of six modules with a number of lectures, assignments, and a final assessment. Um, the material deals primarily with researching in Scotland, England, and Wales. So it's a great certificate to do if you just really want to learn in depth about these areas. Um, it also provides the grounding in theory and practice of genealogy research, record archives, and paleography, which is the study of old handwriting, um, as well as heraldry, which relates to the display and study of like coats of arms, armorial achievements, rank, and pedigree in the United Kingdom. This fall, I'll be starting the postgraduate diploma, which is part two, and it builds on the certificate and provides a greater understanding of the social and historical framework and um, professional, more academic aspects of genealogy. Um, it has three larger modules with assignments and short written pieces, plus a final 5,000 word research project, which I'm really looking forward to. The um, PG Dip addresses Ireland, American, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand, British Empire, Jewish, European, and other sources. And last but certainly not least is the MSC year. And this one provides the opportunity to choose an individual topic of interest and write a 12,000 to 16,000 word dissertation on it. So it's accomplished over one academic year. So if you're interested in this course or any other of the short courses, I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, I have put my contact information on the handout um, or you can check out the website, which is also on the handout. Now, if that all sounds really overwhelming, not a problem. Through the Center for Lifelong Learning, Strathclyde also offers beginner genealogy classes online, which are eight weeks long, and anybody can take them. And they're actually resuming some, some in-class or in-person classes. So if anybody wants to take a trip to Scotland, I'll join you. Um, the first course on this list, Family History Research and Introduction, includes learning about UK indexes, original records, and a range of online sources with a focus on Scottish records. So if this short presentation piques your interest, this course could be a good second step. The text for the class is Discover Your Scottish Ancestry, Internet and Traditional Resources by G. Holton and J. Winch. 
which I've listed in the handout as well, in case you're interested in getting a copy. It's got a lot of great information and they're the experts. <laughs> All right, today we're gonna talk uh, about the following. United Kingdom geography and terms, just some general terms to help you understand how, how things work over there. Then we're gonna do an overview of the UK census in general. And then we'll do early census re records for Scotland. Then the Scotland census later records, which are 1841 to 1921, which are the most useful for genealogy. And then we'll talk about some census tips and challenges. All right, so talking about geography, these different terms are really important so that you'll understand which administrative bodies have the different repositories of information. And I don't know about you, but being an American, I didn't really understand any of this until I took this course. So Great Britain, I'm gonna point here, is the term used to refer to all of England, Wales, and Scotland. So these three areas here. Wales, which is right here, has been under the control of the English government since the 17th century. And for most genealogy intents and purposes, it's legally and administratively the same country as England. Thus, most Welsh records will be sim uh, searched in similar repositories as England. The National Assembly for Wales was established in 1999, and so it, has, it does have more powers and it's incrementally increasing. Oh, I forgot to put up Great Britain is England, Scotland, and Wales. So there you go, just those three. I always thought Great Britain was just England, but nope, it's all three of these. <laughs> all right, Scotland, seen here at the top, which is our focus today, is a separate nation from England and always has been, even though it's part of the United Kingdom. Um, a union exists which began in 1603 when James VI of Scotland also became James I of England, which was called the Union of the Crowns. Thus, Scotland's sovereign is simultaneously the sovereign of Scotland and England. Matters that affect the whole United Kingdom or have an international dimension like defense, international relations, economics, taxation, and so on are reserved powers for Westminster. So that's United Kingdom is. All right, so United Kingdom includes all of Great Britain that we just talked about here, plus Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is seen here in green, kind of a greenish color. It's a largely self-governing part of the United Kingdom and governed by its own assembly. At present, the UK sovereign is Queen Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and North Ireland. So when you hear that term, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Northern Ireland, now you'll know that it means these areas. So what about Ireland down here? This is the Republic of Ireland and it's completely separate. It's been independent since 1922 and has had its present name, Republic of Ireland, since 1937. And it's not part of the United Kingdom. The last major term is British Isles, which usually refers to everything here on this map, plus British dependencies such as the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands. You have to keep in mind that this is a geographical definition because it does include the Republic of Ireland much to their dismay, <laughs> but it's including this Northern Ireland that is part of the UK, plus Ireland itself and the other British dependencies. And those are all considered the British Isles. Hopefully that's helped clear up some things. So Great Britain, these three here, United Kingdom, those three plus Northern Ireland and British Isles, all of the above. All right, so something else important to understand about Scotland is the historic setting for the divisions, and they were called the shires or the counties of Scotland. If you ever hear a term shire in something in the name of a place, that means that tells you that that's a county. These are historic subdivisions established in the Middle Ages and used as administrative divisions up until 1975. But the old names and boundaries are largely changed and have been redrawn since 1975. It's important to know how these present day administrative areas fit with the older system. So that when you're looking for things, you know which area to look. 
So today the local government is based upon council areas, which sometimes incorporate the old county or shire names, but they frequently have vastly different boundaries. So if you can't find an ancestor in one county, it's very possible that they may be in a neighboring county. If you don't find somebody where you think they're supposed to be, this might be why. The boundaries changed again in 1996, and the historic shires don't have any administrative function anymore, but they're still used to some extent for cultural and geographical purposes, as well as genealogy. Some of the current council areas are named after them. Um, then at the most local level in Scotland, you had burgs, which now they refer to communities and they can have community councils down at those levels. So just be aware that you may need to look over historical maps to figure out where your ancestors might be. Oh, I, I forgot to mention the civil parishes. If you heard about a parish there that uh, formerly was Church of Scotland parish area but now they are government parish areas. And a lot of them are similar, but not exactly the same boundaries. All right, so on to the census. So one of the most important sources for bringing our ancestors' lives into focus is the census. Census is aimed to produce an official count of the population. The census provides a snapshot of the people at a particular address on a given night. This information can be used to further your research, for direct ancestors or to broaden your knowledge of the local community and to act as a bridge between the statutory registers and the parish records. So interest in conducting a census of Britain was increasing by the mid 1700s. And though a bill to conduct a nationwide census was defeated early on, the Reverend Alexander Webster published an account of the number of people in Scotland in the year 1755, which was based on returns made by parish ministers. And it's regarded as the most credible estimate of the Scottish population prior to 1801. Though it's known as Webster's census, it's not technically considered a census. Another early project was this statistical account of Scotland compiled from ministers returns by Sir John Sinclair in the 1790s. These accounts provide vitally important reference sources for Scotland's history, geography, and society. They're based primarily on detailed parish records as well, enumerating and describing agriculture, antiquities, industrial productions, population, and natural history. The first truly national census in Britain took place in 1801, and there has been a further census every 10 years since, except for 1941, when the census was called off due to World War II. Little information about individuals survives from 1801 to 1831, at first, the census was not designed to provide huge amounts of information on individuals. It was more about statistics. So only from 1841 were names included and more information was sought every 10 years. They just asked for more and more information, which we'll go into. Enumerators used the information from household and they wrote that out into enumeration books. The original schedules sadly were mostly destroyed but the enumeration books survive that the enumerators wrote out. So uh, these records are indexed by names and available as digital images. Um, at the outbreak of war in 1939, a register was compiled by the Registrar General of everyone and living in the UK for the purpose of issuing identity cards, ration books, and draft papers. The details of people who are contained within the 1939 register who have since died are now being made available. However, since this information is more modern than the Scottish census, which is closed for a hundred year period, only a little bit of information is available for individuals. This includes their address in 1939, their marital status, age, and occupation. You can apply for these official extracts at the National Records of Scotland website, which is also in the handout. So where can you find all these Scottish census records? There's a lot of different places. There's physical providers of the microfilms of the actual documents. These are in many libraries, family history societies in Scotland itself, um, as well as local archives. There's censuses on microfilm with printed or microfiche indexes available. We have these microfilms here at the BYU Family History Library, and they're available at select LDS Family History Centers. 
along with transcriptions to the 1881 census returns for England and Wales and Scotland, which are on family search. Scotlandspeople.gov.uk is the official Scottish government genealogy website. This has pretty much all information that you want to find from Scotland for censuses can be found on Scotland's people. Um, it includes images of the 1841 to 1911 censuses, as well as a full transcript for the 1881 census, which is free to view. Typically, an index ent entry will give the surname, forename, age, registration, district name, and number, the enumeration district, and the page number. So it will help you to find those original images, which I guess good and bad are all available, but only available on Scotland's people. So if you want to look at original images, Scotland's people is the only place that you can find those for the Scottish census. The website is excellent in many ways. It's very thorough but it can be expensive because you, you can do the initial surname search for free, but if you want to view and download any original images, you must use credits that expire after two years. So you just have to carefully use your credits for the documents that are the most important to you. Because of this, it's important to use other indexed online databases to narrow down likely candidates. Often names are similar in the same area, so you need to make sure you get the correct John McAfee or whatever. I was going to say John Smith, but I need a Scottish name there. So it's really great. You can see these transcripts either on Scotland. On Scotland's people, you can see the indexes. And some of these other websites like Find My Past, Family Search, and Ancestry have some transcripts for the Scottish census records. Um, these can be helpful as a way to narrow down the correct individual or family before purchasing original uh, images. Always consider alternate spellings and variations in surnames as you do your searching. So when there's a family that you particularly want to know more about, you, or you think the transcription has errors, or you just feel like there might be more information, that's when purchasing the, an original image can be helpful. Okay, as far as the early census records, which we reviewed already a little bit, but these were 1801, 1811, 1821, and 1831. These collected numbers rather than names, such as numbers of families and houses, individuals, occupations, marriages, christenings, and burials. They're useful for those studying the what was the new science of population statistics um, to understand the rate at which the population was growing and declining, et cetera. Census returns were gathered by enumerators who went around to each household in their district questioning whoever happened to be at home. The enumerators in Scotland were usually the local schoolmasters or other educated and trustworthy individuals. This might include doctors, clergy, lawyers, merchants, and so forth. These census returns merely asked for raw numbers. So they, they were sent to and checked by the local justice of the peace, then sent to the home office. These were the uh, like the compiled summaries of numbers. They were checked again and published in uh, as a parliamentary paper. Unfortunately, the individual details of households and people, which would have been wonderful to have for future historians and all of us genealogists, were not gathered as they were in later censuses. But some enumerators kept their lists of householders along with details such as occupations. Most of these surviving pre-1841 census entries are found in what's called the Kirk Session Records and a few in the old parish record registers. Any of these which are available and contain census information are listed on the natural or the National Records of Scotland or NRS website. They are not indexed. Some local libraries and family history societies have surviving information for certain parishes. There are several guides to these surviving records and you can find more information at the various websites listed here and in my handout. All right, an exciting project being undertaken by the BYU Center for Family History and Genealogy is called the Early British Census Project. This project is working to bring the numerous uh, pre-1841 census records that are spread all over, like those original ones that were written down, they're spread all over in parishes and different societies all over the UK. It's trying to bring all of those into one searchable database. 
It will be designed to help family historians discover their ancestors, offer training for students, and provide data for scholarly research, particularly for local and population studies. The project offers valuable insight into household and occupational structures of early industrial Britain. There are over 1,400 surviving household or individual schedules from the 1801, 1811, 1821, and 1831 censuses. Because the household and individual schedules were never submitted to the central government entity, the original returns are in all these archives across the UK. So they've never been brought together into one database. Most have never been indexed or published and only occasional returns have been digitized. So this project will be fantastic as it continues. Currently, um, students are working on it and other volunteers to bring all these records into a searchable database. So if you want to find information on pre-1841 uh, census data, this can be a good place to, to look. Um, it's in progress right now. Uh, the website is there. It's also on the handout. The first stage of the project is extracting data from English censuses and later stages will capture the records from the rest of the UK. So Scotland doesn't have records in there yet, but it eventually will. So this will be an interesting project to watch and we're really grateful to that program for getting that going. Okay, so now we're going to go into the later census records, which are the ones that you're going to want to use the most. There was a Population Act of 1840 uh, passed, which brought this new form of census about. For the first time, all the households were given individual schedules on which individual names were recorded. There were stiff penalties for giving misleading information. The enumerator visited each household, institution, or ship with the allocated district just before the census date. They would deliver this, this form called a schedule to the head of the house, usually the night before, which would be Sunday night um, for each census, and it would be collected on Monday after the night of the census. So these forms were just gathering everybody who was in each individual location on that Monday night of that census. So all of the UK censuses you'll, you will see have the date that the census was taken. Whoops, I just jumped ahead. <laughs> the date that it was taken as well as like the specific date, like April 11th or whatever. So the enumerators copied these, these forms that they got from the householders into a book, which was then turned in to the government. So that data, again, just like the earlier ones, was checked and checked again, and the, the statistics were published in the parliament um, as a paper. But it's important to understand that the census information that we view today on, on the records online or um, on microfilm are from the enumerator's transcript books, not the original schedules that each householder filled out. Some of those do survive in the individual parishes, but uh, mostly we're looking at the enumerator's transcript. So when you think about the information, it's important to be aware that you know this information was taken down and then transcribed several times. So I'm gonna briefly go through each of the censuses, try to go through this rather quickly to just give you an idea of what type of information you'll find on each one. You'll notice that there's more and more information as the censuses go forward. All of this information that I'm going to show for the next from 1841 to 1821 all can be found on the NRS website, which is linked on the handout. Uh, so you don't need to take detailed notes or memorize any of this. It's just to help you understand what kind of information you can find. Okay, 1841 was the first one. And the, the following information was recorded about every person staying at each abode on census night. The address, surname, and first name. If as happened in lodging houses, hotels, or inns, a person who slept there the night, that night went away early and the name was not known, they would write NK for not known. So if you see NK, that's what that means. The age, which if they're under 15, the exact age was written down, but if they're over 15, the age is rounded down to the nearest five years. So that is super important to keep in mind which I'll go into some more details in a minute, but um, it would have their sex, their occupation, profession, trade, 
employment or of independent means. These were often recorded as abbreviations. Well, they were like standard abbreviations that the census takers were given. And those are also listed in the handout, a link to all those abbreviations. So for instance, you might have HLW and it means hand loom weaver. So it's really good to have access to the um, abbreviations. All right, so it also asks some general questions about whether they were born in that county or whether they were born in the country of the census. This was usually, these were usually yes or no, but sometimes you would get S for Scotland, E for England and Wales, or I for Ireland, or F would mean foreign parts. Okay, problems with the 1841 census is that a lot of parishes are missing. A lot of these were in Fife because the records were lost overboard during transit by boat to Edinburgh. And nobody wanted to repeat the exercise <laughs> for some reason. So unfortunately, that we don't have that information, but it represented about 30% of Fife census data. So if you have ancestors in Fife, I apologize for 1841. Well, I don't apologize, but I apologize for them. <laughs> the other problem with the 1841 census, as I discussed, is that rounding issue. So if someone at age 30 made a mistake or lied and said they were 29, this would be recorded as 25 or someone age 34 would go down as 30. So someone might actually be 46, but claim to be 44, it would go down as 40. So it's really important to remember that when you're looking at these, these ages, if they end with a zero or a five, you can assume that it could be off by five years or more. Some of the enumerators didn't follow the instructions and put the actual ages. But again, you're dealing with people's knowledge. And at this time, um, exact birth years weren't always known. So you have to keep that in mind as well. All right, 1851 was the last census taken before civil registration was required in 1855. So that's when all births, marriages, deaths were required to be registered with the government. So from this census on, heads of households were asked to provide more information, which is awesome. You'll find the name of the street or road, the number or name of the house, the name of each person in the house, their relationship to the head of the family, which is fantastic for genealogy, their marital status, age, sex, rank, profession or occupation, and their birthplace listed by town and county, and also whether they were blind or deaf and dumb. The exact ages are recorded on this census, but it's, again, best to treat this data cautiously because registration of baptisms was inconsistent and some people would have been unsure of their birth date. All right, 1861 was the first one following the start of civil registration in 1855. And because of changes in which entity was responsible, it's kind of interesting, but the Scotland census questions are slightly different from other areas of the UK. In 1861, there were two new questions about the number of children aged between five and 15 that were attending school or being educated at home. And also about the number of rooms with one or more windows, which reflected concerns about housing and sanitary conditions, not to be confused with the window tax, which was abolished in 1851. So it's kind of interesting about the children that can be a really important clue because if it says that there's like three children between five and 15 attending school, but you only see you know, two, then you can probably assume that one of them is away at school on the night of the census. In 1861, we also have the start of street indexes, which is really great. So you can look things up by street and look for your ancestors. Um, once you know what street they're on, you can look that up in the further censuses. These are included on all the censuses after 1861. If you don't find a particular street, it might not have existed in 1861, or it might have had a different name. All right, 1871 census was the same as the 1861 census, but it was the first to include returns from vessels in harbors and docks, or trading along the coast for the enumeration of persons on board Royal Navy vessels in Scottish waters, as well as the Merchant Navy. So sometimes you'll find even uh, English or Wales or these other countries, you'll find some of your ancestors, actually the Scottish census, even if they were not Scottish. There were no new questions added, but there were some changes made. Unemployed could be added to the occupation field if they're out of work on that day. 
um, the question on the number of children attending school was changed from five to five to 13 on the advice of the Scottish commissioners because few children went to school past the age of 12. In 1871, there's information on those that would now be called a mental health difficulty or intellectual impairment. Unfortunately, the terms for these were imbecile or idiot or lunatic. So just be aware that that just means that there's some kind of a mental disability when those are listed. Enumerator instructions show how the census covered travelers, visitors to hotels, large establishments, and vessels. And again, if someone had stayed overnight but left without providing their name and other details, it would be recorded as NK. 1881 census. We're getting more modern here. You're going to get more of your ancestors if they came to the United States or Canada as you get into these later dates. All right, so the number of children attending school was dropped because the education officials were like, hey, we can figure this out from their age and their occupation that says scholar. So that was dropped. But for the first time, there was a count of the number of Gaelic speakers in each locality. Unfortunately, it was not listed by individual at this time. The definition of a house differed from that uh, used in Scotland or in England. Scotland and England had different um, definitions of a house. So Scottish included dwellings with a door opening onto a common stair, which accurately, more accurately reflected households within tenements. Um, the only other issues to be aware of on 1881 are that there are, again, some districts unavailable, um, but one really handy the tool here is that family searches transcripts are available for this census on their website as well as linked on Scotland's people. Um, but as usual, images can only be found on Scotland's people. Okay, 1891. Um, this was taken when the commission appointed under the Local Government uh, Act of 1889 was still in the process of assessing new boundaries of civil parishes and counties. So it starts to get a little confusing here. Always look in neighboring counties when you're looking for your ancestors, if you don't see them where you expect them. Um, from 1891, there were several changes and one new question. Categories for disabilities were revised to deaf and dumb, blind, and lunatic, imbecile, or idiot, which again, those terms just are reprehensible today, but they were just used for mental disabilities at the time. Three columns were added to identify whether a person was employed or an employer or working on their own account. So this is this can be really helpful knowing when you're trying to distinguish whether your person is, you know, different than the other ones with the same name in that area. If you know that your person was employing people, you can find them more easily in, um, in further censuses. Um, again, just looking at what their occupations are also helps you to trace them through the censuses. So in 1881, I mentioned that the Gaelic speaking population was made, but in 1891, they included the question directly on the return. So you knew what language someone spoke. So it would have G for Gaelic or G and E for both Gaelic and English. All right. 1901 census was taken after all those civil parish boundaries were done. So it's important to understand, again, if you can't find a family where you expect them to be. In this census, the question on Gaelic was restricted to those aged three years and over. Persons born abroad were asked to indicate if they were foreign subjects. The term idiot was omitted, leaving the categories of deaf and dumb, blind, lunatic, and imbecile, feeble-minded. There was an additional question on occupation to find out the number of people who carried out their trade or industry at home. For example, some women were involved in the knitting industry on their own account and worked at home. So that would be listed. And so that is really helpful to start seeing a few more women's occupations at this time. The 1901 census also has a list of the registration districts, which is available at the NRS. And this gives the number of enumeration books for each district. It's arranged alphabetically by registration district name and has cross references to the 1901 census street indexes. This can be super helpful if you're having to page through and just look because you're not finding your people in the indexes. All right, 1911 census. It was released following the end of Scotland's 100 year closure period, 
which uh, they do 100 years in the United States. It's a 70 year policy, but in the United Kingdom, it's 100 years. So this currently is the most recent census that we have, and I'll explain about 1921 in a moment. But these records of England, Wales, and Ireland are the original schedules as completed by heads of households, institution, and vessels. However, the Scottish household schedules were destroyed after the completion of the work on the census. So they obviously were not thinking about genealogists when they did that. So Scotland's 1901 census is again taken from those enumeration books, which contain the information transcribed from the household schedules. So if you're looking in the other parts of the UK, you might be able to look at the actual schedules filled out by your ancestors. If they're Scottish at this point, you're still just looking at the numerator transcripts. This one was interesting because it's the first one where the police were asked to assist with the enumeration of persons in barn sheds, caravans, tents, and the open air. Suffragettes were actively protesting by stating that they would not fill out the census but a fine of five pounds deterred many from carrying through. You will find references to suffragettes in the occupation sense section of the household schedule where available. Um, I saw one once that was very interesting where the, the husband had written down that his wife's occupation was flaming suffragette. <laughs> so they really wanted the right to vote and we're using the census as an opportunity to express that. So new questions again, relating to the duration of marriage, the number of children living or deceased at the time of the census, and more changes on the terms for the different difficulties. So they use lunatic when cases where infirmity had been acquired during life, imbecile in extreme cases where the infirmity had in existed from birth or an early age, and feeble-minded in milder cases where the infirmity had existed from birth. So that is actually kind of helpful. They finally defined what those mean. They probably are similar when you're looking back. If you see that for an ancestor, you can use the 1921 definitions to figure out what might have actually been the situation. The question of occupation was extended and the place of birth was extended to include nationality for those born in a foreign country. And so it would actually say what your nationality was. One neat thing in the 1911 census is that they started punch card tabulation and they had this huge staff that was involved in this. They hired these Hollerinth machines, which had been used successfully in the U.S. census of 1890, and this sped up the processing and allowed for the publication of more detailed tables. So, and the NRS has a listing of all the staff that helped with this, so it could be interesting to see if you might have an ancestor that was actually on the staff helping you'd know that you had a genealogist back at, in the day as well. The other thing with the 1911 is that you can find an entire index for all the occupations, which is available on HistPop, which is the Online Historical Population Reports website. And that is also linked in the handout. All right, finally, we get to 1921. You all know that this is 2022, so we should have a 1921 census. Unfortunately, probably due to COVID and other restrictions that has been delayed. So the census of England and Wales is available on Find My Past, but unfortunately the Scotland census is not available yet for 1921, but it will be really exciting when it's released. Supposedly it's going to be released in late 2022. So just watch Scotland's people and the NRS to see when that might happen. All right. Lastly, I know we're a little bit past one o'clock here, but I just wanna go over a couple tips and challenges that you might come across when you are dealing with census records. Um, remember household can appear across two pages, the same as um, other countries' censuses. So always check the page before and after, also looking for neighbors that may be relatives. Also remember not everyone listed as an address actually lived there. Um, and not everyone who lived at an address was necessarily there on census night. So when someone's missing, you can look for other reasons why they might be gone. Maybe they're in the military or they are out, away at school. The census records for the parish of your interest just might be missing. That can be a challenge. There are other census substitutes, which, we, um, which you can go into in more detail on the NRS website. It, it lists all sorts of other possibilities you can research. Married women were usually but not always recorded by their married surname, but if the maiden surname is given, 
it's not necessarily the case that the couple was unmarried. It just depends on how they decided to write it down. Widows sometimes reverted to their maiden names and children often took the name of their stepfather if the mother remarried. So keep all of those things in mind as you're looking at families. If the birthplace of a child, especially the eldest, is different from that of the parents or the census place, it may be that the mother went back to her family parish for her first birth. This can be a valuable clue as to finding the address of her parents. Also, just keep in mind that people did move around, not as much in the 19th century, but if a mine closed or a mill opened or something, there's better work available, families would move. So they might just disappear and turn up in another district. So if your family disappears, look for them in nearby areas. That's when consulting area um, histories can be helpful to know what was going on economically at the time. Um, it's also worth checking nearby workhouses, hospitals, asylums, prisons, barracks, and prison hulks, and any other ships or vessels. Difficulties with census records. One of the big problems is just when there's a mistranscription. Sometimes this old handwriting is very difficult to read. That's why there's a whole study called paleography to try and read old handwriting. So all these volunteers that just do such a wonderful job transcribing and everything, they just do the best they can. And sometimes there are mistakes. So look for alternate spellings when you're searching for your different surnames. And you may find them under a quite different name. Think, oh, an N might look like an H or things like that to try and um, to find them. And then once you do find them, that's a case where looking at the original record is really helpful because you can see what, what you think was actually written there. Sometimes people are just missing or they gave false information despite the warnings and penalties. So this is kind of an unusual one, but um, some people on their occupations might put something like dressmaker or, or of independent means when they were actually a prostitute because that was not likely to be wanted to be listed. So it doesn't mean everybody that says dressmaker was uh, that that was the case, but just keep that in mind as you're looking at occupations. Also, that names are spelled differently from census to census. Illiteracy was common. Often the enumerator was just writing down what he could hear. And when they transferred the information from the household schedules to the enumerator books, there also can be errors. So just keep in mind that everything needs to be taken with a grain of salt. All of your censuses are clues about that family. And as you find discrepancies between the different census years, you can start thinking, oh, well, maybe this happened or maybe that happened. And just knowing what possible problems could have happened is super helpful. So that is the end <laughs> of the presentation. I know I kind of packed a lot of information in there, but um, I love this quote and it reminds me of why the census is so important. History remembers only the celebrated. Genealogy remembers them all. So these censuses are one place where we can find all these names of the ordinary people living in Scotland. And um, I just encourage you to dig in and see what you can find. The best teacher is usually just uh, experience. So uh, if there's anything I can do to be of help, you're welcome to call in to the BYU Family History Library either by phone or on our live help desk and get an appointment and I can help you out with your Scottish genealogy. So that is it.